Hello, this is Dr. Mark Hyman from the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine, now called the Celia Scott Weatherhead Center for Functional Medicine. And we're really pleased today to have Dr. Terry Wallace from the University of Iowa, who's a professor who's pioneering research in multiple sclerosis. In fact, Terry had multiple sclerosis herself, was wheelchair bound, could not even sit up, barely function, about to retire forcibly and discovered a new way of thinking about her condition using food as medicine, identifying the pathways that are the root cause of multiple sclerosis using functional medicine. And she's now running programs called a therapeutic lifestyle program that she's been doing at the VA and is now moving on to the Walls Institute where she'll be able to greatly expand her work and bring the benefit of the science of how we address the root causes of chronic inflammatory autoimmune diseases, specifically MS. So really excited today to have Dr. Terry Walls here at the Center for Functional Medicine. Welcome, Terry. Great. Thanks, so Thanks I'm, for having me. I'm so excited to have you here because you, you are uh, not only a brilliant physician, but you've exemplified something that is impossible, which is recovery from progressive multiple sclerosis. It's not known. It doesn't Correct. happen, it's a one-way street. And so you've gotten the attention of many, many people around the world. And even the MS Society, yes. which uh, was completely resistant to any approaches other than pharmaceutical, and has now funded you to the tune of one and a half million dollars oh, to okay. actually do research showing whether or not the, there's an effect to your protocol. So I'm really excited to hear about your work and we have a bunch of questions, but I really just wanna welcome you today. Thank you, thank you, very glad to be here. So, um, you know, one of the things that, that is commonly thought about functional medicine is that it's for the rich, mm -hmm. that it is a disease approach that requires expensive testing, expensive supplements, long intensive one-on-one -on -one consults with physicians. It's usually fee for service. And here at Cleveland Clinic, we are doing an insurance-based model but we're kind of losing money because it takes so much time. Yeah. We can mm -hmm. spend an hour and a half with a patient and get paid $200, and if you do a 10-minute colonoscopy, you get paid 1000 bucks. So the system's a little messed up, but you figured out a way around that at the VA because it's so constrained there. You can only yeah. do certain things. You can only treat people in a certain way, and I'd love you to share with us how you've kind of created extraordinary results without even a one-on-one -on -one consultation with you. Well, uh, you know, when we first got started, uh, the functional medicine was still uh, a problem word uh, at the VA. Uh, so we called it the Therapeutic Lifestyle Clinic. Uh, and I agreed that I would not be doing any exotic uh, uh, laboratory testing. That I would just do basic primary care tests. Uh, and um, I had one day a week to do this. So we started out gradually with, um, and there's immediately too much demand. So I started with small group visits uh, and as I got more and more comfortable with this, uh, the size of my groups could grow. Uh, and I kept wanting to let everyone in who wanted to be seen. So uh, I kept reimagining how I deliver the service uh, so we could uh, maximize our throughput. Uh, now, because the VA uh, has a population based, um, we don't have to worry about fee for service or insurance model. Uh, and doing this then uh, as a group made a lot of sense. Uh, and since I couldn't really do any functional medicine testing, I got to really test like, okay, so what could I do with very basic primary care testing and just do uh, group classes, group model uh, teaching and with the, uh, and as there got to be a long wait to get to see me, then the ticket to come see me was to agree to my terms, which is 100% commitment for 100 days. Uh, and if you weren't ready, that's fine. You could just work with our dietitian one-on-one. -on -one. But right. if you want to be part of the group experience to be with the Dr. Walls, then right. you had to say, okay, I'll do it 100% for 100 right. days, gluten-free, right. dairy-free, and all those vegetables. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, in, in medicine, well, you know, we say, oh, well, diet changes don't really work. And, and I, what I say to that is, well, you know, if, if you say, say you have a headache and you take a milligram of aspirin, you would conclude that aspirin doesn't work. Yeah. But in fact, it's the dose and the intensity of the treatment that matters, which you've Absolutely. really shown is that you, when you have people adhere to a treatment, it, it, food is a disease-modifying drug. 
It's the most potent one, actually. It is. It's far more powerful than any other drug. I mean, I always say, if I was on a deserted island, I only had one medicine to bring with me, it would be food. Yeah, that would be a very you good know? choice. <laughs> and so what's also interesting about, about your, your program is that you found that it's not just you know, the doctor, but the peer-to-peer -peer coaching and support that actually helps people transform their lifestyle. Yeah, I'd say the peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, coaching as I bring people in and we do uh, as a group the uh, timeline exercise as a group and then the uh, matrix uh, as a group and people uh, then uh, get um, sensitized to other triggers they may not have thought about had they not been in a group and hearing about uh, uh, John Doe's exposures to the burn pits, mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, that's right, I, I had daily burn pit exposure in my first deployment, that's maybe right. that was part of it. Yeah. Um, so that gives a lot, of, uh, a lot more learning and awareness. And then when we do our um, follow-ups, and we're, now we're trying to get them to adopt and sustain, and they're talking about their struggles, it's when their peer says, this is how I deal with my grandkids, it's far more effective than when I, right. with a dietitian, say, this is how you should deal with your grandkids. It's, it's, a, it's a great way to more decentralize health care, change the model, make this scalable. But, you know, we've been talking earlier, and, and you say you get about 50% of the patients better yeah, to some I'd, degree. Some correct. dramatically better, some a little better. Yeah. Uh, and there's a cohort that doesn't get that much better. And I think, you know, that we were challenged challenging to think about that and it, you know it seems to me that there are many causes of MS right oh, absolutely. so so MS is a name right and, and I always say just because you don't know the name of the disease doesn't mean you know what's wrong with you so correct so there may be multiple factors other than the dietary induced ones well you know and I'd also make the observation when I was approved to do my very first study uh, the IRB said okay we want you to do the study but you have to follow what you did so we designed the protocol as rigorously as we could to describe my intervention. But that meant there was no personalization. So I did complete a timeline and matrix. So I knew I was addressing parts of the issue, but I wasn't able to necessarily address all of the factors contributing to their illness because this was part of a research study. Right. Um, and again, in my MS study, it's still constrained by the protocol comparing the, the Swank diet and the Walls diet. Um, so I, I don't have the ability to personalize it as well as I could. Yeah. Uh, even though you know, I'm collecting all of the functional medicine timeline and matrix, so I know there are these other factors that if they were in a private practice, you know, like here in the uh, Center yeah. for Functional Medicine that you could personalize and more completely address. Right. I mean, you, your story was that you were growing up on a farm, you were exposed to atrazine, you, you liked to draw and to draw and all, all the cadavers. Heavy metals, and, right. All, all those heavy, heavy metals, metals from and, my uh, fine arts stuff uh, yeah. and the cadavers. So, so. so your practice of eating huge amounts of cruciferous vegetables was designed to help me detox. Right. I knew that was so, a big so that, that for you was the key, was detoxification. You took algae, you took Chlorella, you took things that helped to detoxify. But if for someone, for example, had, you know, eating tuna fish twice a week and swordfish once a week for a decade, they might need a little bit different treatment. Or if they had been exposed Correct. to Lyme disease, or if they had chronic viral infections that are activating them. Or water damaged buildings. Mold, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, mold, mold biotoxin illness, right. So all those things can dysregulate the immune system. And I think we're going to be seeing more and more as your work progresses right, of right. how and those things play a role. What we'd like to be able to do is to, um, you know, I, I have a, a donor that's talking to me about uh, writing a, a protocol for ALS because I've had yeah. so many people with ALS respond well. And, yes, I'd like to do that next. Um, and so I'm trying to have some conversations about how we could create for the next protocol a little more flexibility so I could address and personalize uh, yeah. this in the construct of a research protocol. Yeah. Which I could do with a private donor, would not be able to do with a funding agency that's going to want a much more rigid uh, protocol. Yeah, well, we, we actually are doing a number of randomized control trials here at the Cleveland Clinic, and, and we are actually figuring out a way to personalize the treatment, sort of the black well, good. So box. So we'll, we'll talk more about how to do that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the things I want to dig into a little bit that you mentioned in your talk was this whole idea of lectins. And oh, lectins yeah. are in grains and they're in beans and, and, and you said they're in seeds as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you know, you have patients who are vegetarians who want to try this or vegans. Um, 
How do you address the lectins? So, and tell us a little bit about how lectins affect the immune right, system. So, so let, let's talk a little bit about lectins. So lectins are a, a protein that usually have a, a sugar attached to it that basically is an insecticide that plants use to poison uh, insects so they don't get consumed. Uh, the uh, compounds are also poisonous to all animals, including us. Uh, and for some people, depending on your genetic vulnerability, the lectins may be a little bit of a problem or a big problem. And again, dose makes uh, uh, the poison. Uh, so how do we deactivate lectins? Cooking will do that. Um, uh, some lectins you can't deactivate, uh, gluten being one of them. You can't get rid of that uh, at all. Um, uh, in lectins in nuts and seeds, you can diminish their inflammatory component by soaking and sprouting. Uh, so in our study, we use soaking and sprouting. In uh, a vegetarian or a vegan, um, I, I ask them to go gluten-free uh, and then use a pressure cooker to cook the uh, gluten-free grains uh, in the legumes um, uh, because that will deactivate the lectins. Mm, um, and if they're going to do nuts and seeds, uh, let's say they're going to do spreaded almonds, uh, spreaded walnuts, that will also uh, greatly diminish uh, mm. the irritation of the lectins in nuts. Mm. And so how do you, how do you deal with the um, sort of this, this dramatic changes in diet? Because you're telling people who are eating one vegetable a day, maybe canned green beans, yeah. to nine cups of so, vegetables. So, yeah, this, this is... Uh, so in, when I was running the uh, VA Therapeutic Lifestyle Clinic, we'd have cooking classes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we'd have uh, our four-hour intake, two hours where they spent with me, and then two hours with the dietitian, And we'd do a cooking demonstration. Uh, so we'd have cooked greens, and we'd have a green smoothie, and it would help them reimagine uh, the grain, alternatives to grain uh, and alternatives to dairy. Uh, and that was very helpful. In so you basically do cooking classes to help people cooking understand classes, how to absolutely. make stuff that actually tastes good. It has to taste good. If it doesn't taste good, they're not going to eat it. And the other uh, thing I believe in, Mark, is uh, you, it, you need to be able to make meals quickly. You can't spend four hours making a meal. You, you, know, you, you need to be able to eat within 30 minutes of starting. Um, I, 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 I want to come back to uh, one of the first things we talked about was how to make this affordable. Yeah, when I was at the VA, my people didn't have money. Mm -hmm. You know, people were usually on disability, uh, money was tight. So we talked a lot about gardening, we talked about hunting, we talked about fishing, uh, we talked about cooking, and we said, um, about vegetable, you know, frozen vegetables are fine. If you can't afford frozen, uh, uh, eat canned, drink the juice. Uh, it doesn't have to be organic. You do have to cook at home. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and so that's why we had cooking classes. And then as you can uh, uh, manage it, improve the quality of your food. Uh, in Iowa, at least, many, many communities have frozen deer meat mm -hmm. that's available to anybody who, who wants to come. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's true. You know, I think, I think there's, there's a series of myths out there that have been yeah. promulgated by the food industry, which is that eating healthy is expensive, yeah. that cooking's difficult, and that, you know, it's much cheaper and better to eat processed food. And I think, I think these are myths that keep people from eating well. And yet, when you, we look at the data, and there's good data, eating well doesn't have to be more expensive, and, and it can be done in, in a good way. In fact, I'm on the board of the Environmental Working Group, and we have yeah. a guide called Good Food on a Tight Budget, which is food that's good for you, good for your wallet, and good for the planet. You're not having the most expensive yeah. filet mignon or the most expensive correct, correct. fish, but you can eat real food for less. You know, and we do talk about um, eating uh, meatless meals using your, your pressure cooker for grains and legumes uh, and uh, intentionally having uh, some vegetarian meals. Uh, I, I do want people to um, use a pressure cooker so they won't have to worry about the lectin issue. But we do uh, talk about how to make this more affordable, yeah. and it can be done. Now, we had some questions from the on audience watching on live stream. One of them was, how long does it take to see changes on the MRI? So um, in our first study, the, one of the advantages of being told that we had money for 20, uh, but can only do 10 and get the safety data, meant that when we ha had our safety data on the first 10, and we showed uh, really remarkably positive quality of life and uh, fatigue severity changes, I went back to my uh, donor, the direct MS group, and said, how about paying for MRIs for the next 10, which they did. Uh, 
so I had that data, but then I needed to find some more money so I could pay to get it analyzed. And we're now finally analyzing that data. So hopefully in another year, I'll be able to tell you uh, this is what we're going to see in that. Mm -hmm. I predict that um, we'll see, again, small group, probably not statistically significant, but there will be uh, a subpopulation there. Uh, where we've had favorable uh, MRI changes. Yeah, I've, I've seen that in my patients, you know, over time. You know, clearly, uh, it's, it's going to be there. Now, now, how about practitioner training? If, if people want to learn how to do this, how the, both the delivery of it yeah. as well as the content, how does a practitioner learn how to do this? Well, um, so every summer I have an event called uh, the WALS Protocol. Uh, last year we added a health practitioner day and a certification program, so we'll have that again this summer. And uh, they can get more information about that at uh, terrywalls.com. Uh, hmm. Another question was, um, how do you deal with the gut other than increasing fiber and, and resistant starch and prebiotics through food? Do you use probiotics? Do you use other well, gut protocols? Yeah. I, you know, I, I remember one of my first patients as a functional medicine doctor was a patient with MS, and she would say to me, when my gut symptoms are bad, my MS gets worse. And I was yeah, like, oh, yeah. okay, there's a connection. There is absolutely a big connection. So the first thing I, I need to sort out is uh, constipation or diarrhea. If they have diarrhea, um, uh, then we're down uh, no raw foods, uh, no fruits, uh, and a lot of bone broth, soup, stews, and probably uh, not a lot of uh, vegetables initially. So it's a fairly low fiber diet. And we uh, get the diarrhea resolved then we gradually increase the fiber and resistant starch. If it's constipation that we're dealing with, then we can gradually, uh, uh, sequentially increase the fiber, the vegetables, the resistant starch, uh, and things like uh, plantain flour, green banana flour. Um, uh, in the paleo world, uh, resist, let's see, uh, potato uh, starch is very popular, but the problem with potato starch, uh, Mark, is that uh, this. Uh, um, one of the very popular products is conventionally grown with a lot of Roundup, is very moldy, and so consuming that product increases your risk of C. diff. Really? Uh, and like so, even the Bob Red Mills organic yes, stuff? Yes. That I would not use hmm. because you're going to uh, have uh, uh, higher, th there's higher rates of C. diff. So uh, plantain, green bananas, chia, flax, uh, psyllium husks, and nine cups of vegetables. So what do you know the patients, for example, that come in, you know, you know, they, they say, like, I've been in a moldy house, I feel sick. Like, how do you, oh, how do you Oh, boy, deal? that's tough. So uh, real-time labs uh, have a number of assays you can use to measure uh, their... Um, Quad mycotoxin. My mycotoxin right. uh, labs. Uh, and then you got to get them out of the environment. Uh, and that, of course, can be extremely challenging to help them uh, navigate that. Yeah. So you have, you have to address those things. You right? have to address those if, mm -hmm. if, if the person's going to get better. Um, you can use phosphatidylcholine, uh, and there are some protocols using IV phosphatidylcholine to help wash those mycotoxins out mm -hmm. as well. Do you, you find that IV phosphatidylcholine and glutathione help with MS? Well, I've not been able to use that in my practice at the VA, uh, but there's certainly many reports that that has been very helpful. Mm -hmm. So what's next? What's your, what's your future dream of... What's well, uh, so uh, future dreams, uh, uh, more uh, research uh, at uh, the university uh, and uh, adding a, a functional medicine uh, private practice uh, through the Wallace Institute. Mm. Uh, you know, and I have so many people trying to reach me from around the globe. Uh, so I'm, I'm working at, uh, so the next thing I'm at, literally that I'm trying to work out is how will I be able to uh, offer these services to people around the globe? Uh, and so I'm, I'm in that process of uh, navigating the structure of how to do that. Yeah, it's really, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that, you know, something so simple and safe uh, and, and accessible, really, and in, even inexpensive. I mean, when you think about the cost of treating MS for a lifetime and the progressive loss of function, the disability, oh, no. the economic cost of the drugs, when you're talking, you know, you said like forty to $70,000 a year forever. 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 And and even when you when you take that's just hard dollars. You, that, that, that's just the drug cost. Right. Well, then you, you add in the MRIs, the uh, lost income from the person, the lost income from the caregivers. Now it's many hundreds of thousands of dollars yeah. a year. Right. And we think about you know solving our healthcare crises. These are these are things we actually know now work. And that you know the fact that there aren't millions of dollars flowing to this research is just sad because of our, it our will come. paradigm. 
that will yeah. come. I hope so, soon. <laughs> you know, and um, when we look at the crushing cost, uh, health care, the crushing cost to our economy, um, we'll never be able to fix this. The government can't mm -hmm. fix this. Our health insurance can't fix this. Mm -hmm. It's going to be fixed by people sharing on their social media that food is what, keel is what cured me. Mm -hmm. it, it was food and lifestyle. Uh, so it will be up to the public. Uh, and then, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm very uh, excited to see the the uh, rapid rise of interest in functional medicine uh, with the naturopaths, the physicians, the uh, chiropractors, the dietitians who get that food is medicine and this is how we're going to uh, restore the health and vitality. Yeah, we patients. say food is a more powerful drug than most drugs when you Absolutely. know how to apply it, right? Absolutely. And I think the challenge with most chronic disease is that it's caused by food, it can be cured by food, and yet physicians know almost nothing about food. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's, it's sort of like uh, taking your leukemic patient uh, and thinking I'm going to fix them uh, by uh, uh, fix their pneumonia by giving them antibiotics and not do, treating their underlying leukemia. Yeah. You can't fix them without treating their underlying leukemia. We can't fix this epidemic of poor health without fixing the underlying terrible food and terrible dietary intake. So one, one last question. You know, Based on your experience personally and also, you know, studying MS intensively and applying these models, what are the mechanisms you think that are at work in your program? Sure. What are the sure. drivers you know, of change that you're seeing in these patients? So, you know, uh, and this has sort of evolved over time. So when I was first reading, decided, decided it's mitochondria that's driving this illness. So I was making this uh, cocktail of uh, mitochondrial supplements, which slowed my decline. I thought, okay, mitochondria are the driver. And then I redesigned my food. And I thought, okay, it's uh, mitochondria and these unrecognized um, um, micronutrient deficiencies, like the triage theory from uh, Bruce Ames. That's what was driving my illness. And then I began to think more about, well, it's the epigenetic changes and the shift in gene expression that is the big driver. Uh, and then I began to think, well, no, I bet it's really the microbiome. Pretty much all of it. <laughs> so it's all of it. And then on top of that are these uh, mycotoxins that might be a factor, these uh, uh, chronic infections that might be a factor, the hormonal dysregulation that might be a factor, so all of that. But I would say the biggest drivers, the microbiome, gene expression, and the mitochondria. And toxins? Toxins, for some people, are, are huge. Because the mitochondria effect is really downstream <laughs> from yeah. something else, yeah. right? Yeah. Something yeah. that's driving inflammation yeah. or the microbiome or toxins or diet. Or that, sure. that poisoned your mitochondria. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Walls, for this amazing time and for your grand rounds here at Cleveland Clinic. Um, I'm excited about what you're doing and hope maybe we can collaborate someday on research together here. That would be wonderful. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for watching.